Who wants to start us off? Coach, are you to the point now where y'all just assume that you're going to go out and play great defense? I think uh, Devin's done a really good job on making adjustments to the core of what we do defensively. And uh, I think through three games, our guys have been borderline elite at handling those adjustments. You know, if you think about it as a, as a bank account from our first practice, and today I think was our 54th practice, 40 of those practices from a defensive standpoint, this is what we do. And those were deposits into the defensive bank account. But when you start getting into conference play where personnel is different um, and, and the value of the possession is increased, I think those adjustments are the difference. The issue is, is you only have, for instance, today, you only have today's practice and tomorrow's shoot around for whatever those adjustments are going to be. But our guys have been really good at handling those adjustments and executing those adjustments, even though they are tweaks to the overall defensive scheme. And I think, like I meet with Devin, um, he's my first meeting on two day before, just talking about only defense, me, him, and the guy that uh, does the prep work, whether that's Antonio or V. And those adjustments have been really good. And I think, I think that, like I told you guys before, I don't want to over uh, underestimate that our guys are playing really hard. And if you can play really hard and play to the scouting report, then it gives you a chance. I know when you've talked about kind of consolidating the rotation, it, it, you've said it kind of starts with Dexter and, and Boots and having at least one of those guys on the court. Yeah, I, we, we, uh, we'll do that tonight. Uh, we always do that the night before the game. But I think that's been a change, Travis, that's helped us. I think that our guys have a much better feel for I'm not I'm not saying it's the NBA, but you know, in the NBA it's all pre done. This is when you're playing, this is when I'm subbing you in, this is how long you're gonna play. I'm not saying it's that, but it's closer to that than what we had been doing. And uh there's a few factors that are involved that I don't want to get into all of it, but you've picked up on it obviously. Um we're not gonna play without decks and boots. And so we want one of them always on the floor. And then we need to have always three go-gets on the floor to the glass. But we also do that sometimes with four, uh, not the player, the quantity. And then we always want to have a minimum of what we call ball handlers of two, but sometimes we play three. And so like the, whatever the software is called, I just call it the geek squad. We, you know, you put those filters into place and identify who those people are and then go, okay, in a perfect world, how many minutes do we want these guys to play? And then you come up with the formula per se, well, this is who has to sub for who. And I think the thing, Travis, that's helped me with the my comfort level with it all is we practice that same way. And I think it's also over time, not initially, uh, but over time, our guys in practice realize what's going on. Like this is this is when I sub into the game, right? Yep. So that's who you're going to be playing with. And so we're accumulating reps of those groupings, not only just on game day, but also in the two days of practice before a game. And then we do a mini version of that even in shoot around. I know from what you said, this is a little maybe chicken and the egg, but how important is it that those two guys are, are now playing their best basketball and being the keys to the... Yeah, and I think uh, I think it's all intertwined for sure. And, I, I you know, like uh, I may have mentioned it, obviously I've studied it since I saw you last time, but Dex had 12, 12 rebounds, only one offensive, uh, but the one offensive was a free throw blockout, which is a, a huge winning play within our program. The 11 defensive rebounds, seven of them came off their 24 missed threes. So as a perimeter guy, Dex is arguably always guarding their best perimeter player. So he's on the perimeter, and then seven times on a long shot, he's getting that long rebound, which is 
otherworldly to be able to say just that stat. But I think on the offensive end, uh, relative to the groupings, the pressure that Dex and Boots applies on the offensive glass, even when they don't get it, there's a byproduct of because of the pressure that they're applying, it allows Henry and Jew to be even better. Like if you look at just Jew's numbers on the glass, Jew has improved at a rate higher than any other player numerically, but it's also because of the groupings of how Dex and Boots specifically are putting pressure. So I think it's all intertwined. Cleveland at South Carolina, obviously coming off probably their best game of the season win over Kentucky. Anything you've seen them where it feels like maybe they figure some stuff out in that game that could carry over into this game against y'all? Well, I, you could argue um, that it's their biggest win since going to the Final Four. Uh, for sure, one of their bigger wins in regular season in a long time. Uh, they played in overtime against Vanderbilt the night that we played Florida. Um, I was able to watch the very end of that while we were having dinner in Gainesville. I did not watch the Tennessee game until I started preparing for our game. But the first game that I watched was Kentucky. And I'm pretty sure they made 11 threes, which is hard to overcome. And then they had 15 offensive rebounds. They're the 22nd best offensive rebounding percentage team in the country. Um, they send their threes, fours, and fives every time. And when one of their threes, fours, or fives shoot it, they send their point guard to the offensive glass. And so uh, both things, I think, were involved. Uh, they were tremendous in their ball screen reads against Kentucky. They were elite at shooting the ball from the perimeter. And then when they missed them, uh, their offensive rebound percentage on the road was as good as you could ever hope for. And so I've, I feel as though, obviously, it's a road game and that presents challenges, but we're playing against a team who probably has a higher level of confidence than they've had since Coach got there. Are you seeing a higher level of confidence for your guys um, <coughs> after, like, the conference start and mm. versus the non-conference start, especially with so many transfers coming in? Yeah, I think that's a part of all of this. And um, that's an adjustment that I'm going to have to do a better job of, of you have ha half your team is new and you're trying to figure them out. Yet because of the net, you need to play a better non-conference schedule and all the things that all of us know. Um, I feel more comfortable. I think the consistency of our preparation has been much better. I think we've made some changes since Christmas that are coming into play more and more often. And I, I, I do think that forget what I think. It matters what our guys know and what our guys do. I think they're holding one another more accountable. And I think the the more that the program or team is led by the players, the better. And I think that that's – you're finding and seeing, not that you guys see it, but more leadership from within, from people wearing uniforms instead of those wearing suits and ties. And I think that, I think that that's always very valuable. Yeah, that said, Buzz, do you as a coach feel any need at all to remind these guys that – if you look at the records, you know, and the way you are playing, that it, it looks like a game that y'all should be able to go out and, and win. But do you feel a need to remind them that, hey, road trips to the SEC are can be treacherous? Or do you have the feeling that these guys are mature enough to understand? Uh, I think I think early on, uh, the second week of the season, we went to Myrtle Beach, and I was very immature in thinking that we had a mature group. Um so I, I think it's probably a combination of the two. I think they're aware, but I think I've tried to be more mature in making sure we call that assumption. Um, we refer to assuming things as a person, and his name is Jacob. So anytime there's an assumption, we say you can't be Jacob. And so um, in not just a road game, not just South Carolina, just stereotypically speaking, uh, there's multiple people within the program saying we can't beat Jacob on certain issues. And um, eight and five non-conference, the first week and a half, 
of SEC play off to a good start. There are several guys that have been in the locker room before that have even started better. And uh, there's nobody in the locker room, including me, that's ever beat South Carolina, regardless of where we played. So um, there, there's a lot at stake for sure. Anybody with a question? You like you just can't wait? What if you yeah. have a Jacob on the team? Uh, Jacob normally sits next to Baby in the stands because Baby is familiar with Jacob. But what if you have a Jacob on the team? Yeah. Oh, uh, we don't. We don't recruit people <laughs> whose names are. Sorry for my assumption. I was Jacob. <laughs> Good question. <laughs>